Isn't he funny, Alan? Or as you might say, isn't he amusing? He's an amusing faggot, isn't he? I'm surprised you didn't say sodomite or pederast. Have you heard the term closet queen? You know what that means? Do you know what it means to be in the closet? In olden days, a glimpse of stocking was a look of something shocking, but now God knows anything goes. I like to enjoy the scenery when I drive, is how beautiful it looked driving up to, to the Camelots. You know, that area of North Stanton is somewhat remote even today. And to me, it just looked beautiful, even though I was going to uh, a pretty bad call. All right, I'm going to leave the call sign as this number. I'm just going to attach you to two uh, 187. I'll show you up. Warning. The following contains graphic descriptions of violent crime that some listeners may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. 911, Quinn, what's your emergency? My husband has a gun and he's in the house. He was convicted in 2011 of killing his mother. He's charged with four counts of kidnapping, 15 counts of sexual assault, four counts of armed robbery with a deadly weapon, and two counts of sexual abuse. That's so we have a subject in custody. Subject in custody. This is Charlie Moreno. This is Andrew Litton. And this is Testify. September 28, 1988, at 1347, El Paso police were dispatched to 4800 North Stanton, the Camelot, to a possible homicide. The responding officer was Rosalia Cubios, a patrol officer just off her one-year probationary period. The victim was James Byers. Just a little bit after 2 o'clock, and here's your weather for today. 88 degrees at the International Airport here in El Paso. Winds about 17 miles per hour from the south to southwest. Tomorrow, we're looking for an expected high of 78 degrees and a low of 55. Sunny across the border region now. Here's Bobby McFerrin. Don't worry, be happy. By request. Well, the call goes out as, you know, a possible homicide. And, you know, being that I was just a couple of weeks fresh off of completing my probation, solo officer, I was pretty nervous. You get that kind of call and and you're by yourself and you kind of rely and hope that, you know, you handle the call right when you get there. So I was pretty nervous when I was driving up anyway. Yeah, I felt my heart pounding pretty quickly. (laughs) And uh, when I get nervous as it is, you know, I feel a rush of blood to my head anyway. So I was feeling like that, but still in control. Just, you know, that adrenaline rush of like, oh my gosh, okay, it's my first real murder. When I arrived at the call, I remember meeting with the friend of the deceased. The friend was Hardy Eckert, neighbor and owner of a local bar. Hardy was a balding man in his late 40s. The one that strikes me most, even now to this date, is the security officer. I believe his last name is Rice. Craig Rice was a security officer. He worked the day shift at the Camelot Guard Shack tall, elderly man, white hair. His uniform looks very professional. But at the same time, like nervous, you know, that that anxiety about him, you know. The security guard tells me that they've called because they suspect that something has happened to Mr. Byers. He's been out of pocket for about four days, and he hadn't advised anyone that he was going to be absent. And his friend, Mr. Eckerd, um, and Mr. Byers had an agreement. And as a matter of fact, they each had keys to their to their places to check on one another when they were out of town. And Mr. Byers had not advised anyone that he was going to be out of town. Not to mention that Mr. Byers' vehicle was parked in the complex, but in a very different, faraway area from where his condominium was at. They had told me that they had already gone to check the vehicle and that they had started to open the trunk, Mr. Eckerd, I believe it was, when um, he noticed 
a, a very foul odor coming from the trunk. He basically almost had a breakdown. And when, when, when he started to break down, I almost lost it myself. And then I just snapped out of it and started asking him questions like, um, all right, when was the last time he was seen? I mean, what, what other than opening the trunk did you all do? If I don't know what's in the trunk, I can't decide how to handle this call. So I open the trunk, and then I start kind of poking around. Carefully, I noticed a bag, a plastic bag containing two human feet. I remember there were quite a bit of uh, blankets and, and well, throws there in the back trunk. And some of those bags were those dark green or black, uh, like hefty type bags, you know, the type that you use for picking up lawn trash, etc. I did have to move around blankets to be able to see what was there because there was also um, a nice chest in there. I don't recall what was in there, whether it was his forearms or I think it might have even been genitals. The thing that runs through my head, well, that ran through my head that night and still does is how is somebody capable of doing that? It's difficult in, in, in my case, anyway, to imagine anybody who could kill somebody else. You know, a person, an animal, but to kill somebody and then dismember them in that way, you know, it's, it was violent. It was definitely something way out of the norm, and that just ran through my head. It's scary. As the responding officer, Gubios noticed that the security guard on the scene was extremely distraught. We wondered if she considered him a suspect right away or if she attempted to interrogate him right off the bat. He was pretty uh, shaken. And uh, because we had, when I went to the academy, because when I had been taught going to the academy or even through my rookie year, uh, basically wait till CAP arrives. The professionals will do all the questioning. So I did just basic questioning. CAP stands for Crimes Against Persons. They handle all the homicides in El Paso. But we'll talk about them a little bit more later. This was the first time Cubios had ever been called to a homicide. We couldn't even imagine what was going through her head. Oh, yes, it seemed like an eternity. I believe at most it might have taken them 20 minutes to arrive. My supervisor, I believe, arrived just a few minutes before CAP did. Uh, but yes, it seemed like an eternity, especially to to me then, still kind of new and, and wet behind the ears, uh, trying to, to figure out, okay, am I doing this right? Please, somebody come here quickly and make sure that I'm doing this right. When Kubios opened up the trunk, she saw that it was scattered with blankets, plastic bags, and it contained a large Coleman cooler. Do you know what size the cooler was? It didn't really say in the statement, was it? What? like? Was it metal? Yes, it was yeah. a metal one. Oh, one of I those I actually ones. Google searched that, and it I, was I a big came one. across It was pretty much the size, the width of the, the trunk itself. Right. All the other parts were stuffed, stuffed in the in back the... behind it. So by this time, Officer Cubios has been dispatched to a possible homicide. There's a subject that's been missing for four days. His vehicle is parked far away from his condominium. There's two witnesses. One of them is about to have a nervous breakdown. And both witnesses have smelled a foul odor coming from the trunk. We're sure at this point Officer Cubios thinks her mind's playing tricks on her. So we had to ask her, what exactly was going through her mind at this point? I really thought it was, uh, you know, legs from, from, a, from a cow, from beef, you know, so... That's why I poked around a little bit more at that bigger bag, thinking, all right, I have to make sure. And I could see that clearly it was not, you know, uh, a leg from <laughs> some sort of a cow or what have you. One thing we noticed while poring over police documents in the James Byers case was a seizure of several items we wouldn't normally see in a murder case. We needed to know from Cubios if the evidence seized at Byers' apartment was consistent with their investigation or part of a smear campaign against the victim. 
one of the things that stood out to me was the itemized uh, porn tapes that were found in the victim's house. I was kind of curious what might lead officers to itemize those kinds of items in a, in a crime scene. There would have to have been some indication that there was a connection of homosexual uh, activity connected to the crime. Um, or in this case, you know, I mean, this porn is porn, right? You know, whether it be a homosexual or just somebody who is uh, has a tendency toward a, a deviation in sexual activity. There would have to be that kind of indication to indicate to a law enforcement officer that this is evidence that we need to take into account. During her nearly 25-year tenure with the El Paso Police Department, Lieutenant Gubios worked her way up through the ranks and worked in several departments, including vice, internal affairs, and performed background investigations for police candidates. We respected her answer, but we wanted to talk with someone who was still in the department to verify that policies haven't changed. Detective Camacho, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. For this episode, Andra and I went over 898 documents. A lot of those were police reports, some from the district attorney's office. We had several from the El Paso County Medical Examiner's Office and a couple from the Texas Department of Public Safety's Forensic Laboratory. Here's Andra to read you a few of those reports. El Paso Police Department Supplementary Report, page 29. At this time, the medical examiner, along with the El Paso Mortuary Service workers, went ahead and took out several body parts and laid them on the ground just by the rear of the car. Two views of the torso with the head on, two views of the pillow pointing to two holes in the pillowcase, two views of the bed with the blood stain both sides of the bed, two views of the blood stain pointing to holes in the mattress, one view of a whitish stain on the bed cover downstairs, one view of the left leg, one view of a right leg, one view of the ice chest and torso in the trunk, one view of the contents of the ice chest showing two arms, what appeared to be a penis in a small plastic bag, and a piece of flesh in the ice chest in a small bag. One view of a pruning saw and an axe in an upstairs hall closet. In total, El Paso police collected 32 VHS tapes from the scene. The Boys in the Band, Rough Cut, Reds 2, Unmarked, Cheer, Printer Devil, Like a Horse, Caddyshack, Reds 1, Consenting Adult, Wet Shorts, KC Trucking, Huge One, Karate Kid, West Side Boys. There, in every single report from every single witness statement, there's some mention of him being gay or homosexual, so it's almost like a leading to this, you know, but really a character building for, you know, what... Actually, let me just off the top, go ahead and give me your your name and rank and your position there at the police department. My name is Detective David Camacho. I'm a detective with the Crimes Against Persons Unit. We investigate all violent crimes to include homicides, uh, capital murders, and officer-involved shootings. I've been with the police department for 12 years now. In this particular case, we did notice that there was a lot of pornography um, gathered at the scene. And so we just kind of, you had mentioned to me earlier that there there may be other reasons why that may have been collected by detectives. Can you go into that again? Yes, uh, not a problem. So the case that you were referring to was a 1988 case. Uh, And of course, policing has evolved, technology has evolved, and so has science. Uh, But just the method of just police work and evidence basically remained the same. So if we have multiple pornographic videos, whether they be homosexual or heterosexual, you want to collect everything and anything because it may not mean something at the scene, but once the case starts developing and the investigation starts taking its course, then it may be a huge piece of evidence. And you only have one shot at it, which is when you are collecting the evidence and processing the scene. There was crime scene in 1988, very few officers and very few training, and there was, of course, homicide detectives. So to collect pieces like that and collect them individually is still very common for numerous reasons. One for uh, forensics, for latent prints. So if if I start putting all my, if they were VHS, which I suppose in 1988, if they are VHS type videos and I put them all in a box, then the videos may rub on each other or I might damage some evidence that each video holds one two collecting them differently once we start identifying if he is homosexual or heterosexual 
once we start identifying lovers, friends, people that he watched movies with for entertainment or for sexual gratification, then they'll be able to tell us, well, yeah, I only watched, you know, that movie with him and this movie with him. And the last time I watched it with him, um, I remember vividly this scene. So if we go back to the VHS tape and it's still at that scene. Now we have kind of a timeline and now we can kind of see, well, do you know what other friends did he share these movies with and start going from there because he may or may not have watched movies with different people and different people had different tastes according to whatever he was in the mood with, with his partner, of course. When we go to a scene... Detective Camacho did a good job of explaining to Andrew and I why that evidence would have been taken. It wasn't necessarily an attempt to smear the victim's character or lifestyle. It was more a better safe than sorry type of technique when collecting evidence. And as it turns out, the victim's sexual preference was actually going to play a role in the suspect's defense. That will lead you the right way and ultimately identify somebody. Detective Camacho made it clear that the police's job is not to convict a suspect. They're there to collect all of the evidence at the scene and follow where it takes them. He says one of the reasons investigations take a long time is that they also have to eliminate possible suspects, which is sometimes a time-consuming process. We spend a lot of time exonerating people because just something doesn't fit the evidence. At this time, we do want to thank Detective Camacho as well as retired Lieutenant Gubios for the information explaining the evidence collection. As somebody that looks at these police reports objectively, sometimes it's hard to understand the context of what's going on, and we do appreciate them explaining that to us. One of the things I forgot to mention is about the dismemberment of this victim in our case from 1988, his genitals were cut off from him. Do you think from a detective standpoint, would that have been an immediate red flag to collect any sexual material at his home? Yes, that, that, that's a big red flag. Um, there's, there's a lot of studies on violent murders like that. The studies yield to that if the genitals are exposed, then it was more than likely a random killing. That's what the studies say in, in the books say of uh, cold, case, cold cases. If the genitals are exposed, then it was more than likely a stranger kill. If the genitals are covered after a violent act, then it was somebody that had an intimate relationship. If the genitals are cut off, like in this situation, it was somebody that had an intimate relationship and it was angered by something that the victim did and wanted to take that from them. Interesting. Okay, well, um, that kind of covers it from my end on this. With so many witness statements talking about the victim's gay lifestyle, we were curious as to if the responding officer, Officer Gubios, had noticed anything in particular that day when she drove up. Was there any indication while you were there that either of them were gay? No, I did not know that. So it wasn't very clear or obvious to you that Mr. Eckert, who was the, the witness, was gay at the time? Not to my recollection. To be quite honest, I didn't give it much thought myself, so I, I don't recall. But I can say this. In that time, it would have been uh, 1988, being gay was not as outwardly accepted as it is nowadays. One of the witness statements was from Hardy Eckert. In addition to what he had already told Officer Gubios, he also told detectives a few things. Number one, that he was the owner of the apartment bar, which was a gay bar here in El Paso at the time. And he also told them that Mr. Byers would frequent different gay bars and perhaps that would be a, a good avenue to take to investigate this murder. The other thing that he told them was that Mr. Byers had a lover that passed away from a drug overdose several years back. And since then, Mr. Byers was on a sort of downward spiral. His drinking was getting more out of control, and overall, his quality of life just wasn't really great. Another thing that he mentioned to the detectives was that Mr. Byers recently had a roommate by the name of Bethel. Now... At this point, nobody knew where Bethel was, but it was safe to say that he had already moved out weeks before the murder. 
Another very important part to the witness's statement was that he told the detectives that Mr. Byers had recently told him he had several ongoing problems with his next door neighbor. Apparently the problems got so bad that the cops had been called, the homeowners association was notified, and apparently things got so intense that Mr. Byers had hired a construction company to build a stone wall between him and his neighbor's property. This information led the police to the next door neighbor. We'll call her J.A. This is Andrew reading her witness statement. I've had problems with Mr. Byers over the past year only. I believe that it started last year when there was a gay convention here in El Paso, Texas. At that time, Mr. Byers had a party at his apartment, and another lady called the police due to the noise. I had even called the guard because of the noise. I guess that guard called him, and after that, Mr. Byers came to my front door, and he was completely nude. He kept ringing the bell, and I could see him out my window by the front door. I called the guard at the front, but he told me he couldn't leave his post and that he would call the other security. When the police arrived, he had gone back and the police had gone to his apartment and found a bunch of naked boys. And they told the police they didn't want any trouble and that they had called a taxi and were leaving. I've had continuing problems with him ever since that time. He'll have wild parties and he would use the jacuzzi at about midnight with his radio on at all times. This man on the weekend would have someone with him, probably from the gay bars. I've seen taxis deliver people there at night also. Are you related to a Yes, uh uh-huh. I'm working on this documentary about a case where she was a witness. It was at the Camelot. We called J.A.'s daughter for background on the investigation. She didn't officially want to go on record, but what she did say Uh, was that her mother was now 91 years old and would have been 61 at the time of Byer's murder. Do you think you or your mother would be able to talk with us about it? Her mother's age and failing memory would prevent her from recalling many of the details from Byer's murder 30 years ago. I don't think she would remember things correctly. Right. And to tell you the truth, I don't remember much of it other than... While police were interviewing J.A., she mentioned that she had heard Mr. Byers in the backyard the night before he disappeared, and he wasn't alone. She said he sounded like he was with another man, young, possibly Anglo, and that they were discussing the stone wall that was being built between the two properties. She heard Byers continually refer to her as a bitch, and she thought that he may have been drunk at the time. They were outside for about 15 minutes, and then, just as quietly, they went back inside. According to another witness statement from a construction worker that was there working on the rock wall, he mentioned that he also saw a young white male walking out of Mr. Byers' apartment that morning. He also described him as looking as if he just got a tip from the victim. This information was given out to the security staff there at the Camelot. Officer Craig Rice actually identified who this person was. He notified the police department, and it was shortly thereafter that the Crimes Against Persons detectives found a 21-year-old white male by the name of Brian Vincent Russell. He was living in a unit there at the Camelot that belonged to his mother. His mother had been living in Albuquerque while Brian went to school at the University of Texas at El Paso. Brian Russell at first told detectives that he had been to Mr. Byers' apartment to get the address or phone number for a young man who had been living there. His name was Beto. He told the detectives that he had a couple of beers with Mr. Byers, but he had left early in the morning to go to class. And by then, Mr. Byers was already asleep. After some investigation, the detectives brought Brian Russell back to ask for another statement. At this time, Brian Russell confessed to the shooting and dismemberment of Mr. Byers. He had claimed that Mr. Byers had been making sexual advances at him that night, and he decided to leave after Mr. Byers went to bed. He drove around for several hours and returned early in the morning and entered Mr. Byers' unlocked apartment and killed him. He claimed the defense of gay panic. He also told detectives that he believed Mr. Byers was spreading AIDS and that made him very angry. Brian Vincent Russell pled not guilty to murder and claimed his confession was coerced by the detectives. His defense attorney told the judge that Russell had not been read his Miranda warning. He also told them that the police denied him an attorney during questioning. Once the jury trial began, the judge agreed to order a new trial and hear the motion to suppress his second statement. After reading a lot of these documents, we wanted to talk to somebody about the social issues of being gay in the 1980s. 
he shot the dude, he slit his throat, he stabbed him, he dismembered him. I mean, you know, the only thing he didn't do was set him on fire. That shows a level of intent and a level of um, hatred and uh, energy that like isn't about panic. Panic doesn't result in people doing multiple layers of damage to someone like that. My full name is Brenda Ann Risch. I have an MA and a PhD in comparative literature. Um, my specialties were gender, um, anthropology of the body, film, um, German and French and American literature. So I got, a light, I got my master's in social work and started doing this community work, which I love. So I work half time as a LGBTQ affirming therapist and I am the founder and full-time executive director of the Borderland Rainbow Center. And even if you have full-blown um, combat history PTSD, you don't, or you are never like so out of control that you're going to shoot, stab, um, slit the throat of and mutilate the body of somebody, right? Cut them into seven pieces like that. You don't get, I think that's like a, again, another mythological like fantasy about how trauma works, but like, oh yeah, you might pull a trigger, you might stab someone, but you know, at some point you're going to come back to reality. You're going to be back in the world that other people are in. I mean, if you're having a full on psychotic break, maybe, but guess what? He wouldn't have then suddenly been okay and able to talk coherently after that. He would have been continuing to be in a state of psychosis, right? So, you know, there's very few psychological conditions that I could, I'm not, and I'm not a psychiatrist, so I don't know everything, right? I just know the basics of mental health, right? That, that good social workers do, but I can't think of anything that's like likely or prevalent that could have been affecting him that would have caused that behavior. Andrew and I were curious about the whole LGBT movement and the history. So I asked Dr. Rish if she could help us understand some of the more important milestones that she was familiar with. You know, the rise of the Mattachine Society in the 50s, um, you know, where they were trying to show that, LGBT, uh, that gay men could have positive, um, healthy relationships, right? And they were trying to change the words from homosexual to homophile because they were saying um, gay love, not gay sex, that having sex as the focus of your identity was a negative, right? Which is true because we have a very puritanical culture where we're very judgmental about sex and sexual activity, right? So the 60s and 70s, I mean, you know, we think of the civil rights movement, you know, through the ends of the 50s and the beginnings of the 60s, the sexual freedom that people started to demand and practice. Um, and that was freeing for a lot of people who were um, not straight or not monogamous, right? Um, and so people had bigger scopes for expression, sexual expression. Now, back then, especially legislatively, there were a lot of challenges for the gay community. There were a lot of states, lots of counties, and lots of municipalities in the U.S. that had what they called morality laws. These morality laws basically made it illegal for a gay person to be in public. Um, we still had laws in place all the way up until the end of the 70s and even in the 80s in some places where police could go into bars, they could pull people out, they could make them take their clothing off and count how many items of clothing they had from the opposite sex. And if they had too many items of clothing from the opposite sex on, they could arrest them for uh, breaching public morals or public indecency or whatever, basically for cross-dressing. And so because culture at that time was often focused around uh, kind of non-normative clothing as a way, like non-sex normative clothing. So if you're a woman wearing items of men's clothing or if you're a man wearing items of women's clothing to show your, your queerness, your lesbianness or your gayness or your non-straightness, um, that was a way for the police to try to entrap you. One of the most famous police raids at a gay bar was the Stonewall Riots. This occurred on June 28, 1969 in Greenwich Village of New York City. But these raids were occurring all over the U.S. A lot of gay bars throughout the country were taking extreme measures to help protect themselves, their business, and their customers from the authorities. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bar raids were, that's where they would go in and count what kind, what kind of clothing do you have on, right? They'd start look. And so there was some bars had like little alarms installed under the bar where they would press a button and a red light would go on. And then all the guys would grab a girl and all the girls would grab a guy and dance so that it looked more like a straight bar. Um, you know, so like literally like, boom, just like you see those movies of the speakeasies where they'd like hide the drinks. Well, here they would just like switch up their partners and try to look straight. 
on a national level, there were always incidents of violence being targeted at the LGBT community. However, I asked Dr. Rish if she could tell us a little bit about her experience in researching the LGBT community here in El Paso. Absolutely. I mean, one of the projects I did as an academic, as a faculty member at UTEP, is I interviewed over 100, um, me and my team interviewed over 100 LGBT folks from El Paso and Juarez, and some of them talked about that generation, the 70s and 80s in El Paso. And um, they talked about, uh, you know, going to the OP and it being routine for people to drive by and their low riders and, you know, guys, groups of guys and their low riders and to shout epithets and to jump out and try to beat the crap out of people or drag them in their car, you know, things like that. And that there were many cases of people being assaulted on the street and beaten and um, where from the victim's point of view, the police were not very effective in uh, either preventing that or doing anything about it. Um, there's also a case uh, from a couple years ago of a transgender person who apparently was using substances and was, I don't know how, how bad that use was or how, what the person's physical state was at the time, but they were caught, somebody called the cops for like a domestic disturbance at a hotel and the police in the handling of that human being ended up, um, that person died. And so there were many allegations about potential police brutality and, you know, being motivated by the fact that this was a transgender individual who was experiencing this, you know, uncontrolled behavior while high. Um, And so there were a lot of questions asked about that. So that's another case that, you know, is familiar to me from El Paso. During the 1980s, the world was also seeing a new danger to public health. A new form of cancer was sweeping the world, and because of the early symptoms being found predominantly in gay men, the media would label this the gay plague, a term that would later be repeated by governments and politicians. There was not much information about this new threat that would later be called AIDS. And when the media started putting it out and naming it the gay disease or the gay plague, um, there was a a giant sweep of panic throughout the United States, and that was represented in the news. Um... It, there are movies that now tell that story, like And the Band Played On, or, or you know, uh, different movies like that where they talk about the things that happen to people, how an HIV-positive person's body wouldn't be given a decent burial, that the hospital, when they died, might throw them in a dumpster, or you weren't allowed to fly on an airplane if you were HIV-positive. And then the kids who were infected through um, birth or IV transmission were witch-hunted and run out of schools, and their families were threatened, and crosses burned on their yard and all this, right? So HIV positive people were portrayed as monsters and infected infected people who were dangerous, um, who were amoral, who were um, perverted, who were just an abomination. The average homosexual, if there be such, is promiscuous. He is not interested in nor capable of a lasting relationship like that of a heterosexual marriage. His sex life, his love life, consists of a series of chance encounters at the clubs and bars he inhabits and even on the streets of- I remember that moment in history when if Ronald Reagan had stepped up to the plate and put the power of the medical complex in the United States and the research complex to to its challenge and said cure this shit he could have stopped a pandemic across the world it might have been an epidemic still but there are millions of people across the globe who would not have died if the United States had invested its full power as a scientific and medical research industry to trying to find effective ways to prevent and stop HIV when it first was identified. And because there was no funding and because it languished, that exacerbated the, the vilification and the witch hunt against HIV-positive people. And then by painted with the same tar brush, anybody who was different, anybody who had sex with men, or with needle users, or with prostitutes, they immediately were painted with that tar brush, too. The poet W.H. Auden said that the true men of action in our times are not the politicians and statesmen, but the scientists. I believe that's especially true when it comes to the AIDS epidemic. To think we didn't even know we had a disease until June of 1981 when five cases appeared in California. The AIDS virus itself was discovered in 1984. The blood test became available in 1985. A treatment drug, AZT, has been brought to market in record time and others are coming. Work on a vaccine is now underway in many laboratories, as you've been told. Spending on AIDS 
has been one of the fastest growing parts of the budget. And ladies and gentlemen, it deserves to be. As a social worker, how often do you see people from the LGBTQ community asking for help because of dependency issues or uh, things that have stemmed from alcohol or drugs? If you ask me as a social worker how many times I've seen clients who are LGBTQ who have substance use issues and then have had problems because of that, I can say there's a lot of them, right? But not all of them actually ask for help around their substance use because there's still an immense amount of shame publicly for um, being being thought of as an alcoholic or an addict, right? And we have a lot of moral narratives that make those people into um, lazy, slovenly, willful, you know, uncontrollable monsters, right? Who are just selfish pigs. And you know, if that's how you're going to be labeled for having an, an addiction, then gee, you're not going to be. That's not the first thing you're going to ask for help with. You're going to ask for help with other problems in your life, and then you may come to. An awareness that that substance use is at a core of the problem, but you know there's also a lot of stigma that if you come to an LGBT focused support group for for substances that you'll know everybody's going to know you, and now you're outed. So you have to be okay with people knowing. So you have to be at a fairly high level of recovery to to get the help. I think in some ways. Brian Vincent Russell had told the detectives that he killed Mr. Byers as a defense against unwanted sexual advances. He said he felt threatened, he felt trapped, and it sent him into a rage. The truth was that Brian Russell had left the victim to sleep, and it wasn't until several hours later that he returned to murder and dismember him. I wanted to ask Dr. Rish if there would have been any other alternatives that Brian Russell could have taken, other than murdering a sleeping man. Uh, Well, stop drinking, A. Um, You know, leave when you start to feel uncomfortable. Say no. I mean, there's like a million responses you can have. You know, if someone is is um, focusing unwanted sexual attention on you, there are always ways to be very direct and clear and respectful toward that person. Um, I think if you're drunk and you're already your cognition's already impaired, it's harder to do that. So pr- who knows? Like, at what point did these quote unquote advances happen, right? But let's be honest. Um, you know, UTEP dude um, who did this, like, how, you know, you don't go into somebody's house at two in the morning with alcohol openly out there, not, not intending to drink. Right. So also you should be aware then as an adult, that there are particular risks when you go into an adult environment like that, you're going to an after party at somebody's house. I mean, come on. Right. Um, it's not exactly like this man hid his identity, right? He was pretty open. So, um, so a rational person, I think would have said, Hey man, it's probably pretty light. I'm a cute guy. I'm young. I'm, I'm a stud it's pretty likely that I might get hit on. So how am I going to prepare myself for that? I'm a, you know, maybe I'll make it real clear at the beginning of the night, I'm not interested, right? That I don't mind, you know, I'm cool hanging out with y'all and drinking, having fun, even watching a porno together, whatever, but I'm not down for anything else. You know, and let's face it, men have been, have been raised traditionally within U.S. culture to have that kind of freedom of speech among each, amongst each other to be straightforward about their sexual desire or lack thereof and their willingness to participate in something or not. If this were a female, that would be a very different story. Right. And, you know, as we see right now, which is why I brought up Anita Hill and, you know, the current case right now with um, Dr. Ford, um, you know, women, even when women clearly say no and clearly don't want something, they still, everybody still thinks they're full of shit. Right. Um, So, (laughs) So it doesn't, you know, kind of as a woman, do you even have a voice in that situation? But as a man and a young man, and I mean, a guy who was privileged enough to be going to college in 1988, because guess, yeah, well, yeah, because guess what? Lots of folks in El Paso did not go to college in 1988, right? And certainly very few brown people were going to college in 1988, more than had previously gone in the 60s or 70s, but still not. UTEP was still not majority brown at that point, right? So this guy is a privileged guy on some level, right? When you look at the, at the social economic kind of status of El Paso as a whole. So, you know, he would have had every reason and every ability, I think, to be able to say, hey, man, I'm not down for this. I don't want to do this. I'm not interested. Now, in the, in the paperwork and the documents that we have, his 
confession essentially says, well, I did tell him no multiple times, but he just kept moving towards me or he would kind of, you know, keep advancing towards me. But he never actually left the home. So he stayed, I think it was at least an hour and a half, two hours after these advances started towards him. And he supposedly continued to say no. And then he said no. And then he, but he stayed there in the home. Um, so, yeah. So what do you make of that? I mean, right. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. Do we want to say, oh, um, you know, he really wanted it. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to project myself into somebody's mind. Um, you know, was he a a closeted man? Was he curious? Maybe, um, you know, we know that human sexuality is not black and white and that most people have some fantasies, interests, or, um, conditions under which they could be sexually active with the same sex, even if they live a completely heterosexual lifestyle and never co- and never overtly show any interest. Um, so all of those things are a factor, right? But yeah, he's a grown man. He could have gotten up and left. He certainly was able to get up and walk out after an hour and a half or two hours. So why couldn't he have done that after a half an hour if he was so massively uncomfortable to the point that he was induced into a rage where he had to come back and slaughter someone, right? That doesn't make any sense to me. This isn't an instance where a bunch of guys came up to him who were, were drunk and gay and like in an alley and coming onto him and push him against the wall. And like, like, not that that ever, ha- like, when does that ever even happen? Right? Like that's a bunch of bullshit, right? It's always the other way around. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> but you know, like then you could understand, man, if somebody panicked and freaked out and hit somebody and they hit their head and they died or something, right? Or you pull a knife and you stab somebody and you end up killing them because you're panicking. Literally your life is threatened in that moment. Right, but that's not what was happening here. So I understand why the jury found him guilty. The story makes no sense. The district attorney's office had offered Brian Russell a plea deal of 55 years. He declined the offer. His defense was that he was not guilty of murder, but instead it was manslaughter, because according to him, he had no control of himself during the killing. On October 23, 1989, The jury of the 210th District Court disagreed with his defense, and they found him, the defendant, 23-year-old Brian Vincent Russell, guilty of the crime of murder with a deadly weapon. He was sentenced to 99 years in state prison. He is currently 51 years old and still in prison in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Clements Unit. His earliest release date is September 2073. Thank you to everyone who helped with this episode. Retired Lieutenant Rosalia Cubios, Dr. Brenda Rich at the Borderland Rainbow Center. If you'd like to learn more about the services and events they offer, please visit our website, testifypodcast.com, and click on resources. We'd also like to thank Detective David Camacho at the El Paso Police Department Crimes Against Persons Unit, Ross Ingram for our original theme music, and the El Paso Herald Post for graciously helping us bring this podcast to you all. If you're interested in supporting our show, please visit our website site testifypodcast.com to learn more support us on our patreon for special bonus material your contributions go towards paying for open records requests our equipment and paying it forward by donating to local victims advocacy groups here in el paso be sure to subscribe on itunes apple Podcasts, google play music or radio public this is andrew Litton, and this is charlie moreno and this has been testify testify